Okay, so today we're going to be looking at signing statements and executive orders. So when we look to the contemporary basis of where we see the pres presidential power, we know that it comes mostly from the party themselves, um, the popular mobil mobilization, so grassroots, and then the administration and how they use that popularity uh, to get their agenda across. So when the party... Um, the President's party controls Congress, we know that that helps them to share the policy goals. That means that as long as the party is cohesive, that there aren't divisions and factions within the party, that they usually have the ability to get a lot of influence um, and get a lot of that agenda passed. Okay. Obviously the opposite is true, and that if the President's party is the minority party in Congress, it's going to be difficult for them to shepherd that policy through. All right, and so this just kind of gives us the idea. Um, with the gray, you've got divided government, and you see that it's harder to get stuff passed. All right, we also know that another base of power is the ability to go public. We've talked about this before in class. That the advent of television, radio, the internet, all of those things have helped the president to spread his message and get the word out on policy. All right, so one way also is the administrative state, and this is the idea that they have been able to try to, to increase power by working with Congress. So there has definitely been a, a stretch of power with the executive office. Okay. Um, the White House has gained more and more control over time over the bureaucracy, which we will look at, um, especially more in depth when we look at the bureaucracy by itself. But it is definitely tied into um, the White House with the idea of the um, oversight implications. Um, and then when we look at the idea of executive orders, all right, and agreements in which the president can do things unilaterally, that's also going to be a sign that the president has really um, amped up this idea of the administrative mechanisms in order to gain um, and expand their power. So if we look at the executive office, all right, you've got 400 staff members just in the White House offices, and then you've got 1,400 the EOP, or the Executive Office of the President. So we know that their their jobs are basically to propose legislation um, and then interacting with Congress and trying to get their stuff passed. Okay. We also have this idea of the regulatory, in which the White House, really, uh, through, the, through the budget, gets to determine how um, those agencies should operate. They get to appoint right, the leaders, and then they can also determine how they should operate. All right, so if we look at this idea of decree, okay, we've, we've talked about executive orders. We've looked at presidential decrees. We've talked about executive agreements, which is basically like a treaty, but without the Senate. Um, we can see the national security findings, the directives that they send to them, uh, proclamations. The president can just proclaim something. They can reorganize the way that the government is laid out. And as we already talked about, they can also use signing statements. And these are going to be, once again, when the president is able to express displeasure with the bill while still signing it. So they're going to um, write what they disagree with in the bill as to why it's not good and yet still sign it because there are pieces that they believe are necessary for government to work. All right. Uh, you'll see that over the years, okay, we've always had executive orders. This doesn't go back, but we have them with Washington as well. Um, but moving, you know, through history, we're seeing more and more of them. Okay. So finally, when we look to the expressed powers, and just reminding ourselves, and this is going to be what we're going to look at with our FRQs and this um, activity. All right, we've got three major issues here looking at the presidential power. So when we see the U.S. versus Nixon case, it's usually talked about as a blow to presidential power 
because Nixon then had to turn over all of the tapes, even though he said he had executive privilege. All right, which so basically, Supreme Court is saying executive privilege is not absolute. Um, and this is going to be uh, to looking at um, the idea of the way that the administration can work. So this is by declaration. So the Obama administration used a declaration by telling the DOJ to stop enforcing the Defense of Marriage Act. Congress made the laws, but the president is overseeing the agency that's implementing them. So if he's telling them to stop doing something, um, it's telling them how to run that agency. And then when we look here, we had uh, President Bush um, issued an order, an executive order, that stopped the use, um, in many cases, of stem cells. So it limited it to uh, a few um, strands, basically, uh, when we're looking at the federally funded research. And then, again, like we talked about before with executive orders, you have this ability to pass without Congress, but then it's easy for the next president to do away with. So President Bush put this in, in place with his executive order, and then in 2009, when President Obama became president, he then issued an executive order which overturned Bush's order. Neither one of them needed to use Congress. All right, so we will see you in class.